with the lights. I just told him to hang on. Take your time. Okay. Yeah. All right, I'm here. So we're good? The sound is good? You have sound? Okay, somebody says they have a picture. I just need somebody to say they have sound. And we're good. <coughs> okay, we're talking. Good. We have sound. We have everything. So this is outstanding. We're all here. We're live. A little bit of an announcement. I'm going to probably make the announcements twice for those who are early and those who are late. You might take a look at your blogs. Those of you who don't check your blogs, go to the Real Lab website. Uh, I think you look under Learn More. Uh, that's the tab at the top. Then under Learn More, you look for blogs and Thanks for noticing that there's a better picture here today. We worked at making it less terrible than last time. Uh, we were less experienced last time. And we got some help from Mike, of course. But if you look under your blogs, um, you'll see that in the last like 10 days or so, we've added like uh, five uh, additional blogs. So you might uh, take a peek at those. Might even learn something, who knows, it's possible. And we're going to, starting July 10, be adding an additional um, video chat on Thursdays. So I'll be running the video chats on Tuesdays, as usual, and then on Thursday we'll have an additional video chat uh, that will be run by coaches which would be an opportunity both for additional learning, uh, give you a chance to ask, ask additional questions, and it would be an opportunity for coaches to uh, practice uh, coaching uh, live and on air. So lots of opportunities for people to learn and do stuff. I talked to Uh, a woman who attended the Phoenix seminar, this uh, last one, and she talked about the real love bubble that uh, she experienced during and after the seminar. She wrote to say that uh, she experienced a peace that was something that she thought could only be experienced during the trances uh, induced by uh, Eastern religions. Uh, she described it as being in the world but not of the world and it really is uh, an experience that is uh, that powerful when we feel unconditionally loved we really can be surrounded by a swirl of conflict and criticism and anger and contention and uh, all manner of life's difficulties and not be pulled down by it so it, it's really always about real love. It really is. So that's, that's what we need. So I suggest to people that when they feel like they're just torn up and it seems like they're just going to be carried away by the conflicts in their lives, that they don't get distracted. It's really about getting more of what we need most, about feeling loved.
And as we feel that, and as we share it with the people around us, we really do create an island of peace in the world around us. And it makes all the difference. Not a little difference. It makes all the difference. We create our own world, our own universe, uh, rather than hoping that the world, that the things around us will change and that then, maybe, we'll be happy. Good luck with that, changing the world around you. Uh, you may have noticed uh, on the website that uh, Donna put up an announcement that uh, she'll be available as a professional uh, as a real love coach and I couldn't possibly uh, recommend uh, too highly um, hiring her as a coach. Uh, she has a natural talent that is uh, just amazing. Uh, you won't reg uh, regret either hiring her as a coach or recommending her to uh, others. Uh, since that announcement uh, we've already had several uh, requests for that and you'll also notice that there was uh, announced an availability uh, for a real love uh, retreat or uh, meeting place or the availability of a place where people can come and be surrounded by uh, a real love atmosphere here in Georgia uh, which is the entire uh, first floor of our home and I recommend that. Uh, this is a place where you can either come at times we've already scheduled or if you have a group of five to seven to nine uh, we could take larger groups depending on uh, the arrangements that we make. Uh, you can bring them here and then we, uh, Donna and I and other coaches that we could bring in would be available uh, in consultation to offer real love coaching and counseling uh, to those groups but it's a place of refuge. Um, it's a, what I, what I would, uh, and we've never really considered uh, naming the retreat, but I would consider the name Kipuka. Um, it's uh, in, in Hawaii, uh, I don't know if Rock and Robin is on, but uh, in Hawaii when uh, a lava flow uh, flows down from um, the volcano, uh, it, it consumes everything in its path. But sometimes there's an elevated place uh, that as the flow goes down consumes everything, but if there's an elevated place, uh, sometimes, uh, well, if it's elevated enough, it'll consume everything but this little tiny island of vegetation. And that little surviving island, that oasis of life that survives um, this torrent of hot rock that eats up everything else um, is a kipuka, an oasis of life. And that's kind of how I picture this um, this place being, this uh, retreat center. Uh, somebody asked what time the Thursday video chat will be. Again, it will be at 9 p.m. Eastern Time. So same time, uh, same place, same you know web address. Uh, it will just be run by uh, experienced coaches and possibly be an opportunity occasionally for a coaching student to uh, uh, to do. But initially it will be run by experienced uh, coaches. Uh, I think Kelly will run the first one uh, July 10 uh, and then others like uh, Andy and uh, John Hauser and, and others. So uh, eventually we anticipate that there will be um, video chats on every day of the week, but for now it will be Tuesday and Thursday. Somebody asked this question, this morning my wife bought some junk uh, at a yard sale and then proudly presented it to me and I fell right back into my getting and protecting behaviors. Then I beat myself up over it. And that's just how we learn. So here you thought you were doing pretty well and she bought some junk at a yard sale which you didn't agree with. And so what could you have done differently? So she got some stuff. You didn't like the stuff she got. And so the instant that you felt irritated about the stuff, all you had to do was say, wow, how, how interesting. 
instead of saying, I disagree with what you got, all you had to do was reframe it and say, so what matters here most? The stuff or the love in our relationship? You don't have to lie and say, wow, I really like the stuff you got, because clearly you didn't. So you don't ever have to lie in real love. You just say, where did you get it? Um, show me this. Um, sh you know, ask her to show you the stuff that she got. And if you find that you're still angry about it, then say, um, you know, hey, I I've got to go make a phone call. I'll be back in a second. Everybody understands I have to go make a phone call. You don't have to say, um, I have to go make a phone call or I'll kill you. You don't have to say that. You don't have to finish the entire sentence. I have to go make a phone call. I'll be back in a minute. Go tell somebody else you want to kill her for buying, you know, two extra lawnmowers that don't run or whatever it is she got. Um, talk to somebody else about how you thought it was a foolish mistake. Then on another occasion, not then, because right while she's proudly showing you what she got at a yard sale, that is not the time to say, uh, we already have three garages full of old stuff. Uh, on another occasion, you might say, um, we already have three garages full of stuff. If you don't have three garages full of stuff, and she only occasionally <coughs> excuse me, brings in, you know, foolish little items, and if it's not breaking your budget, and it's not filling up your garage, and you just happen dis to disagree with the what you think are stupid items she gets, well then, who cares? Big deal. If it's not affecting your budget, and it's not filling your house, and you just happen to disagree with it, well, it's not even worth talking about, is it? There's so many things that we make the topic of, of a conflict that just ain't worth talking about. <coughs> And then you fell back into your getting and protecting behaviors and you felt guilty about it. Well, you don't need to beat yourself up over it. You just have to note it. You just go, oh, I'll be darned. I'm not as loving as I thought. That's all. It's just information. You thought you were this much loving and it turns out you were that much loving. You were less. So what? And if you were unkind to her, then later when you're able to be more loving, you go back to her and you say, do you remember when I was snippy with you about the yard sale items? Well, of course you'll remember. You say, well, you know, I was snippy and I regret that. I, you know, I was being unkind and snotty and, and I, you know, I, I'm going to watch that more. Don't say, I won't do that again. <sighs> of course you will. <clears throat> so lighten up, kid. Garth says, I have a question. My uh, sister lives close to me and insists that I come to visit her. Over the last several years, I've gone to visit her once every couple of weeks. In fact, <clears throat> in the last four years, uh, let's see here, over the last several years, I've gone to visit her once every couple of weeks. Hmm. Uh, in the last four years, she has visited me once. <laughs> for about an hour. Most times I've been okay with this and I'm feeling like I'm not willing to do this anymore. Uh, I'm okay with saying no, but it feels like the old family pattern of punishing her for being who she is. How do I love her better? Oh, so you simply make a decision about how often you want to go visit her. And th that has nothing to do with how often she visits you. Um, I used to have a friend years ago, and my, my closest friend, in fact, and it was much like this. Um, I visited him three times for every time he would visit me. It turns out that the distance from my house to his house was apparently, or, or from his house to my house, was apparently ten times longer than from my house to his house. And because he found it much harder to visit me. And I simply had to make a decision. If we were going to get together, I had to decide whether I was willing to live with the mismatch in the number of times that 
I visited him versus the times that he came to visit me. So I made the decision that if we were going to get together, I was willing to visit him. I was willing to make the trip to his house more often. I was simply willing to do that. But I made the decision that I was willing to go to his house X number of times. And sometimes he would say, why don't you come down more than that? And then I would just say, when he would ask more than that number of times, it wasn't like I would say, no, up yours, or no, because you don't come to see me, that's not the reason. It was no, because it was more than the number of times I had decided to visit. See? So you have to make the decision how often you're willing to visit her or whether you're willing to visit her this particular time. And you have to make it not related to the number of times she visits you. That's where real love is involved, you see? So you care about her happiness unrelated to what she gives you. So each time you go to visit her, it is a gift. It really is a gift. It's very kind of you. But then when she says to you, well, but I want you to come this time. Well, that doesn't obligate you to go the next time. You see? It doesn't obligate you to go any particular time. We think, some, some people do, uh, that, that if you love somebody, you have to do what they do, ask you to do every time. And that's not true. You make a decision what you're able to offer freely. So you decide, hmm, um, I'm going to go visit my sister this weekend, um, but I'm not going to visit her. Uh, I'm probably not going to see her the rest of this month. And then she calls you and says, well, I want to see you this next weekend. And you say, you know, um, I just can't. I don't have time. Well, you might physically have time. There might be time in a day, um, but you don't have time for her. You're truthfully telling her you really don't have time. You don't have time set aside sufficient for her. And you don't have to explain yourself any more than that. But you make it unrelated to what she's doing. That would be punishing. Clear? Here's somebody who says, I want to be able to help people, uh, but I fear being responsible for someone else's happiness. I don't, like as in when somebody makes a real love call to this person or helping them in any number of ways, I don't want to make an irreversible mistake with someone else's life. Well, honey, how can you interact with human beings without making mistakes with somebody's life? And is there such a thing as an irreversible mistake? I mean, actually, is there such a thing as a mistake that's not reversible? Or that's not irreversible? They're all, all the mistakes you make are done. They're all, they're all irreversible in, in some sense. I mean, you can't go back and undo them. Um, but if you walked around feeling like, oh my goodness, I've made a mistake, it can never be undone, you'd never move. So it's just part of living with and working with human beings that you're going to make mistakes with people and they're going to affect them. It's part of learning and growing. It's part of being a human. So you can't avoid this little trick. You just can't. Uh, if you have any desire to help people at all, you have to be willing to take the risk of making mistakes with them. It, it, there just isn't another way. So uh, buck up, learn, make mistakes, make lots of them in fact. Make them faster so that you can learn from them so that you'll make them make the same ones less often. That's all I can recommend. The other day, I found myself using the $20 million analogy in the wrong way. As I was talking about my fear of failure, 
that was produced from seeing some of my ex-wife's old friends, someone asked, how would I feel if I had a beautiful new wife, a successful business, uh, t and tons of money? I responded that I would not have any fears. After I thought about it overnight, I saw that I was using uh, $20 million that was counterfeit. I went back to when I had everything in life, everything that was imitation. Yeah, it felt good for that moment. But then I woke up and told myself that it was not the $20 million worth of unconditional love, and I smiled smart. However, I do find it difficult to sometimes differentiate the $20 million worth of imitation love versus unconditional love. Help me with some insights into this space. That happened during a real love conference call. Sure, but not the light. Yeah, well, I, you, I don't need to help you. You've already uh, differentiated it. Um, it's, it's really easy to talk about how everything is going great when really what we're talking about is things that are going great. I mean, when two people get together and they say, how are you, what people almost invariably talk about is not how are you. They talk about how are the things that are in their life. So when people say, how are you? They say, well, let's see, the kids are okay. Um, my health, they talk about what things have happened in their lives. Um, and when they say things are bad, what they talk about are things. Um, bills that haven't been paid, problems that are happening, things that have happened to their kids. They don't talk about what they're learning, whether they're learning to be loving whether they're telling the truth about themselves. When was the last time you asked somebody how are things and somebody told you what they're learning and whether they're uh, growing in their ability to tell the truth and be loving? When was the last time that ever happened to you? Other than in a real love context. And that's the only thing that matters. Whereas if your happiness is tied to the things that are going on around you, well then you're an absolute prisoner. Then you're a, you're a complete slave to the events that are happening. So if the stock market's up, you're happy. And if the stock market's down, you're not. And if you got a traffic ticket that day, then you're doomed. Um, if the weather's bad, you're screwed. Uh, what a way to live. And yet that's exactly how most people live. So actually I don't need to tell you a thing you've already nailed it exactly here for a moment you got confused about how your life was happy when you had everything going well and that's how my life was was for most of my life I thought things were great because I was making lots of money and boy things were not going great I talked to a physician on the phone just not long ago and and uh, he had been making lots of money all of his life and he'd gotten to a place where uh, he was miserable and empty and alone and uh, a friend of his was uh, had identified some uh, telltale behaviors in his life that demonstrated that he was not doing well and he was about to be reported for his, to his licensing board, in fact. And um, so I talked to him, and I just briefly described his life to him. I said, and so you're feeling like this, and you're feeling like this, and you're feeling alone and miserable, and you're hiding it from everybody, and your marriage is a mess, and this is how it's going with your kids. Now, mind you, this I hadn't even met him. I'm just talking to him on the phone for the first time. And, and he said, my gosh, how could you possibly know all that? And I said, well, because that's, that's how life goes when your entire life is tied to... Uh, success and happiness from imitation love and it's what it's like when nobody understands you and you've never felt loved unconditionally and it was quite a shock for him to to come to the understanding that love is what he's been looking for for his entire 50 plus years so I think we're probably gonna end up talking again hope so I recently moved in with friends after living for 10 plus years in isolation. They're both nice, but I'm having some adjustment problems. Like now, we're renovating their home, and I'm being required to do a whole lot more than I think is necessary. He's very perfectionistic, and I'm being inconvenienced more than I think I should be. So 
you're living in a house with these people, you've been alone for a long time, they're renovating their home and you're being pushed around more than you think you should be, I'm finding myself feeling like a little kid who isn't good enough, not pleasing dad, getting resentful and having to sort through the causes of my negative emotions. I'm fully realizing this is all about me not feeling enough love and having to set boundaries and decide what I'm willing to do or not to do. Well, okay, so you get that you're not feeling loved enough, but if you set boundaries, you're going to end up defending yourself. So the problem with boundaries is that you, you want to feel loved and you want to be as loving as possible. And while you're being loving, that doesn't mean that you need to let people stomp all over your head. But you want to feel loved and connected with these people. And just notice physically what happens when I do this. As soon as I set up a boundary between you and me, do you think I'm going to feel more connected to you? There's no way. Boundaries separate people and they never lead to feeling more loved. So if you feel like you're being pushed around during the process of the renovation more than you think is necessary, first I would check it out with a wise loving person before I went and you know talked it over with the owners of the house. Talk it over with a wise person and just just talk it over and see what they think. See if a wise person loving you will simply change your perspective. Sometimes all you need is to feel more loved. And if you did, that would be the end of it. So if you felt more loved, it might turn out that the renovation of the house isn't even the problem. Now, wouldn't that be cool? I've seen that over and over again. People call me and they say, I hate my job. And it turns out that, no, they really don't. They just don't feel loved enough when they go to work that they can like their job. Then they get enough real love in their lives, and it turns out the job wasn't the problem ever in the first place. So get more love from people, then see if the renovation of the house is even the problem. If it is, then, with the help and suggestion of some wise friends, then you might say, to the people who are renovating the house, the people with whom you live, you might say, okay, so so when, when you're renovating the house and you tell me that I have to whatever, because I, I don't know the circumstances, you didn't describe them, you tell me I have to sleep in the freezer. Um, when I have to sleep in the freezer during the renovation, um, I feel unusually cold. See, that would just be, in, in, so instead of saying, I have to set a boundary. D don't set boundaries. Just describe the consequences of how that feels to you. They may be unaware of them. Don't go straight to boundaries. You say, you know, I, I feel cold when I'm in the freezer. And then th they may say, well, I'll be darned. Well, of course you do. It would never occur to us you'd feel cold sleeping in the freezer. See, or it may turn out that you know when they're renovating whatever it is, you're you're being you you describe the inconvenience, and then they say, well, huh, well, then how about if instead of our, for example, it may be that they they are nailing drywall till two in the morning and it's too noisy for you, they say, well, you know we hadn't thought about that. Um, how about if we stop dry, nailing drywall at eleven p.m. Would would that be better for you? Well, sure. You see. Describe the effects. Then after you describe the effects and you just naturally, you allow people to offer change before you make demands and before you set boundaries. It's way more loving. If it turns out that what, see, Donna and I live in this kind of relationship every day. I don't go to Donna and say, okay, Listen, you witch, when you do this, you've got to absolutely stop this. I've, I'm going to set this boundary. You're never going to do this again. No. No, I say, you may not be aware, but when you do this, um, it affects me in this way. And, and you may continue to do this for as long as you'd like, but when you do this, this is the effect it has. And she says, I'll be. I, I didn't know this. Then she says, well, then, how about if I do this? And I say, well, gosh, that would be just lovely. Thank you. 
So notice what just happened. I described the effects, then she makes an offer, if she'd like, to change her behavior. If she doesn't offer to change her behavior, then I would have to make a decision what I would choose to do. Then I would have to decide, well, then if she's not going to, for example, quit um, hammering the wall while I'm watching a movie, then I would have to decide, well, maybe I'll have to watch a movie in another room. See? Same with you. You offer information, the other person makes an offer to change their behavior, or they don't. You then make a decision about what you're going to do. It's a series of freely made offers after gathering information. Oh, it's, it's wonderful. As opposed to negotiating, which is, I'll do this if you do that, which is really one series of hostage taking after another. How gratifying do you think that is? It isn't. It's one trade after another, and people never feel loved after trading. Way better to love. Gather information, make an offer. That's a loving offer. It's unconditionally given. Then the other person gathers some information, and they make an offer, which is unconditionally given. Oh, man, this is fun. I strongly suggest it. <clears throat> this whole loving thing it's just kind of has a feel. It's really neat. Um, I just got a... Let me see here. My son is six years old. And he likes to steal candy from stores. Hey, just train him to steal bigger stuff and you'll, you know, make a living. No, that's not the answer. My son is six years old and likes to steal candy from stores and he hides it in his pocket till he gets home. A couple of times I've caught him before we've left the store. I can't believe how sneaky he is for a six year old. I've brought him to the store manager even and had him talk to my son about jail and so on, which is a really smart idea. Um, but really not so clever with a six-year-old. Talking to a kid about jail works after they're about, oh, probably 11 or 12. But a six-year-old doesn't understand jail any, none, zero. Uh, and I'm going to get to this in a minute. I've had the store manager make him uh, mop the floors or clean up the trash. Still pretty complicated for a six-year-old, and we're going to get to this. My son has also missed dinner and dessert as a consequence of stealing. So far, none of these consequences are uncomfortable enough for him to stop his habit of stealing because I found more packs of gum in his pocket today. I'm seeing black and white striped outfits in his future <laughs> if he doesn't stop now. <laughs> Do you have any suggestions? Yeah, okay, so this is important. I'm, I'm hearing from you this list of consequences. And all of these consequences that you're describing, the mopping the floors, talking to the store manager about jail, and all, these are really great consequences for a kid who's older than six. Um, like the talking about jail is great for a teenager. Um, mopping the floor and all that's great for consequences for a kid who's like eight to 10. Um, this kid is six. <laughs> and there's too much consequences here for a six-year-old. What I'm not hearing is a list of understanding and compassion. So if I were talking to the six-year-old, I mean, I would sit down with this kid and we'll assume that the kid's name is, uh, I don't know, Klepto, for example. Um, and I would say, so Klep, um, so I understand that you like to steal candy from, from stores. It's pretty fun to steal candy from stores, isn't it? Uh, the kid needs some understanding. He needs to be seen. He needs to be understood. Um, it's kind of fun sneaking it out, isn't it? It's fun getting it off the shelf. It's fun sneaking it in your pocket. It's fun getting it out past everybody else and doing something that nobody else knows about. It makes you feel pretty powerful, strong, um, 
It makes you feel cool. It's fun. I get it. And it's still wrong. But I get it that you do it. And I'm not mad at you about it. None mad. Look at look and I'd get it I'd get Clep's little face, his little six year old face, I'd get little his little face right up to mine and touch his little cheeks while I said this and I'd say, I want you to notice something. I'm not mad at you. None mad. I don't, none. Um, but you can't keep stealing. I get why you do it. And if you felt happy, if you felt more loved by me, you wouldn't be doing this. Now, you won't understand everything I'm saying to you right now, but you wouldn't. So, what I'm going to do is, I get why you do it, but when we go to the stores now, <clears throat> I'm not even going to tell you not to steal. Because you, you already know it's wrong. But I will frisk you um, when we leave the stores. And when we get to the car, I mean, I'll, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to check your pockets, and I'm going to check your shirt, and I mean, I'm going to frisk you. And you need to learn how a kid is properly frisked by the police. I mean, this is, you're going to go up and down his pants. I mean, you are going to frisk this kid. You're going to make sure he's got nothing on him. And you're going to frisk him several times. And if he has anything on him, and you're going to frisk him with no irritation, no impatience, you're going to frisk him like you'd shake his hand. And you're going to do it right outside the store door, right while everybody's walking by in front of everybody. So there's no shaming to it. You're not going to be impatient. You're not going to be irritated. But right out there, outside the grocery store door with everybody going in and out, you're going to have your kids' hands on the door of the, on the wall of the grocery store, on the bricks, just like the police do. And you're going to be frisking your kid in front of the world. And if you find any stuff, so every time you find stuff for the next, oh, five or six or however many times you decide after that, then he has to ride in the cart in the store. And you got to be thinking here, Mom. You have to think like a thief. If he's in the cart, you can't park the cart when you're picking stuff up. You can't park, the, you can't have a cart anywhere near stuff he can put in his pocket. So he can't be sitting in the cart that you put stuff in. Are you paying attention? So he can't be in the cart you put, or he'll reach around and get the stuff and put in his pocket. And you can't park the cart near the, what are they called, the shelves, or he'll pick stuff up. So you'll have to have two carts, one cart for the groceries and then one cart for the little klepto boy who steals stuff. And again, there's no shaming and there's no irritation. But essentially it is a mobile jail while you're in the store. And you don't say this is because you're a little thief. No. Just when you go in the store you, you, you've already told him ahead of time that you'll be in the cart. And he already knows why. You don't need to deliver the lecture. He knows why he's not a retard. If he were a retard, he wouldn't be getting stuff past you in the store. <laughs> So, that's the natural consequence. The natural consequence of stealing is to be put in jail in the store. It's not to be mopping floors. <laughs> this kid's mopping floor in the store and going, what is wrong with my stupid mother? What does mopping a floor have to do with stealing stuff off the shelves? <laughs> and gradually, and you love him this whole time. You're loving him and you're looking at him and smiling and you're telling him you understand. It's the loving him that's going to make the difference loving him more than the consequences and this kid's gonna quit it. No kidding. He will. Kids don't naturally want to steal. I spent some time with my husband tonight. It didn't go well. I went with him to bless a house. I went to be supportive. Let's see if I went. He must be like a minister then. 
to bless a house. Uh, I want to be supportive, but I'm not ready to do this. I felt judgmental and out of place. To top it off, the woman had a fair amount of cleavage showing. Maybe that's what you do at house blessings. <laughs> and I have issues uh, around his emptiness and need to look at other women. We left the house and I mentioned the woman's chest and asked if he had trouble not looking. Of course, he said no. <laughs> All men say that. <laughs> no, no dear, I didn't notice. <laughs> Uh, but then he asked me if I had trouble not looking. <laughs> that was very clever of him. Uh, I said, yes, I did. And I had trouble not worrying about whether or not you were looking. Then we went to the bank. Uh, I assumed to look at more cleavages. And after I made a comment about how he divided up the withdrawal, the conversation went south. Oh, you're having a really terrible night. <laughs> this is the second time in a row in over 30 years that he has given me less. Oh, less, I see, less of the withdrawal. I feel like he's making a statement or punishing me. He also said, after giving me the money, uh, you're in control. Again, the conversation went further south. Uh, when we got home, he said something to me like, we had just... Uh, come from renewing our wedding vows and I didn't give him the answer he liked. We went further south <laughs> gee honey in the house. I tried to talk and he cut me off really quick. Further south we went. Oh boy, we should be there any minute. So I assume that you you're that you were trying to reach the South Pole. <laughs> oh golly. So you started off with um you went. You tried to be supportive in going with him to uh, bless a house. Yeah. Now, notice one of the first things you said was, "I'm not ready to do this." You went with him to bless a house. This is really an important thing. Um, is that you said you went to be supportive, but you said, "I am not ready to do this." If you feel like you're not ready to be sufficiently loving, uh, to be supportive of uh, a partner, a husband, a wife, a child, or whatever, and you feel like you're not ready, you're probably not. Then don't. It's just like one of the first questions that we had, where uh, somebody asked, you know, my sister wants me to come visit her, but I really just don't feel like I want to. Don't. Then don't. Because if we walk into a situ situation feeling like we're not sufficiently unconditionally loving to handle that situation, you know we probably won't handle it well. And then, in your words, it goes further south and souther and souther, and before long, we're sitting there burning in the fi fires of hell and we're wondering how we got there. So, don't do it. Don't even start. If you feel like you can't do it, don't start down that path. And then, here's this woman, and you have issues around women who are showing off their bodies in inappropriate right ways. Well, if you have an issue with women who are showing off their breasts like this, please don't drag your husband into your issues about other women's bodies. Don't do it. Uh, and if you feel like he has an issue with looking at other women, then you know, then let him deal with his own issues. And don't you drag him into conversations about it, especially when you are already not being loving. That conversation couldn't go anywhere but straight to hell, and yet you insisted on having it. Now, you already know this, but we're having this conversation because you brought it up. Then, he's already mad at you, and you go to the bank, uh, and he withdraws money and he has an opportunity to just stick it to you by giving you less money. Well, man, this was a golden opportunity for him to make you feel bad. Uh, and then he sticks it to you with one sentence after another after another another and you kept talking. And, and I understand why. Uh, boy, I'm not making fun of you. I mean, I've been there. Uh, but but you get why you you really understand why 
So the idea is, once you're in a situation where you can't handle something in a loving way, shut up, because it can only get worse. Can Greg speak to porn and masturbation and the impact that it has not only to the family but the individual himself. My husband has read what Greg has written about it and basically thinks that not practicing masturbation is not natural, that all men have to do it. Oh, this is such a common lie and I want you to keep in mind that there are a lot of men who are listening to me say this, who are saying well, there must be something wrong with you, meaning me. Yeah. Listen, I, I, I'm I'm a guy from the top of my head to the bottom of my feet. I, I get it. Uh, I have the same urges everybody else does. Here's the problem. Anything that we use, when, when we don't feel unconditionally loved, we will reach out for anything that makes us feel better temporarily. Not might, we will. We reach out for imitation love temporarily, temporarily make us feel better as naturally, as unconsciously, as quickly, as predictably, um, as we pull away from a source of pain, as predictably as we pull away from a hot stove when we touch it. It just happens. And that's why men believe that, well, masturbation is just natural. It's just normal. And if something is natural and normal, then it must be, what's the next word out of their mouths? Healthy. And I get that. But I'm telling you, we've now had thousands of years of monks who have sat in cloisters for their entire lives and never practiced masturbation and um, they died healthy. So it's been absolutely proven, not just by monks, but by many millions of men that it is not necessary and that there's not something unnatural in not practicing it. The reason that men are so become so energetic and so animated about defending this practice is that they feel like they need it. When you don't have sufficient real love in your life, y you have to use something. And the temporary pleasure, uh, the temporary release from the pain of not feeling loved that comes from um, masturbation, sex, um, conditional approval, money, power, all forms of imitation love is just virtually irresistible. And with masturbation in particular, because you feel like, well, I'm not hurting anybody else, um, how could that possibly be wrong? Gee, that's a very tempting reasoning. The problem with it is that any activity that we engage in that distracts us in any way from following a path that that distracts us from the path of uh, finding unconditional love and sharing it with other people becomes potentially not just, you know, a prop becomes potentially deadly. No kidding. If your primary goal in life, for example, were to become an Olympic athlete, an, not just a, but an Olympic gold medal athlete, let's say that was your primary goal, that's the only thing you wanted to be then, well, would eating Cheetos and cream puffs and Twinkies, oh, just two or three times a day, would that be harmful? Yeah, yeah, actually it would. And what if you just did it in the privacy of your own home? And you didn't really bother anybody else. You get to follow the analogy? You weren't really harming anybody else, and it wasn't really that big a deal. You know, you really would see an effect, because compared to the athletes who didn't do that, it would affect your times. 
It really would because it would keep you from eating healthy foods. It would distract you from your training program. It would distract your attitude. It, it would affect you. Any time that we become self-indulgent and we focus on ourselves, it's that whole self thing. Any time we do that, it becomes potentially deadly. And I'm here to tell you that any time somebody becomes the slightest bit defensive about it, says, well, but I, um, they're not just doing it occasionally. I promise you. Yet how many thousand men have I spoken to on this subject? As soon as somebody goes, you can't tell me, as soon as they do that, they're not masturbating occasionally. Um, they're doing it pretty often. And it becomes quite addictive. Men who do this begin to see sex as quite a focus in their lives. And a, the vast majority of them also use uh, pornography as a stimulant. Those men also tend to see women as objects. And it affects the uh, sexual part of their relationship with their wives hugely, in fact virtually kills the sex life they have with their wives and then in turn has an enormous impact on the emotional part of the relationship with their wives and the way they treat all women. The effect of porn and masturbation is huge. It, it, it's unbelievable the disease that it's become. So. I'm not telling anybody to stop. That's the other part. People think I'm telling them to quit. I'm not telling anybody to do anything. Notice as we talk in all these things, I'm not telling you to do spit. So don't. Do, people say, you're telling me to quit. Oh, no, 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 please, go ahead. I'm telling you that the cost is phenomenal. Go ahead, do, do whatever you want to do. And the people who become most uh, animated about it are the people who are most addicted. So, fine. Uh, a friend shared with me about his recent participation in Oprah's Eckhart Tolle, I don't know if it's Tolle or Tolle's, I don't know how to pronounce his last name worldwide webcast based on his latest book. He spoke of having to heal his pain body. Hmm. Heal his pain by first loving himself before being able to love others. He has since signed up for a local course on learning to love uh, in hopes to become more loving and connected with others. I suggested that learning to love oneself is like being in a desert dying of thirst then being told to just drink water so as not to die of dehydration. Why do supposedly brilliant scholars and authors keep treating only the symptoms and never address the true cause of people's unhappiness? People keep, uh, people keep talking about the same thing, learning to love ourselves first over and over because they haven't seen unconditional love. They keep teaching us the same old stuff because they haven't seen what works. Um, I'm, I'm amazed that we keep hearing the same old stuff. We keep hearing the just love yourself, which has never worked. Um, I've never seen anybody do that. I haven't seen it happen. Um, maybe somebody's done that. Um, but we keep hearing it because we haven't seen unconditional love. Uh, I've talked to thousands of people now. And as I talk to people, like I talked to a man earlier today who was 50-something years old, and who in his entire 50 something years as I talked to him on the phone and as I described to him what unconditional love was and he just cried and said now this was a guy who was recommended to me by a friend and, he, and his friend said this man will lie to you he will deny to you that he's an alcoholic he'll deny to you that he has any problems he'll deny to you that he needs to do anything and he said but I want you to try to talk to him anyway I said okay so I talked to this guy 50 something years old and I described to him what unconditional love was I described to him why his life was a mess I described to him why he was an alcoholic and why he has a terrible marriage and remember his friend said he was going to deny all of this and this 50 something year old man simply wept and said when do we start 
So all he needed was a simple description of what unconditional love is, and it was over. I mean, do you get how powerful this is? Now, how many times do you think this man has heard descriptions of just love yourself? And how effective was it in all these times? In all this time, this man has heard just love yourself, just love yourself, just love yourself. And he's been to church. He, he told me he's been a devout Christian all of his life. And he says he's prayed and prayed and prayed and been told that God loves him. And he said all of this time he has thought it's absolutely hopeless because nobody loves him. All he needed to know what was what unconditional love looked like. And he said, when do we start? And that's what we offer people. That's what we offer the world. Is teaching them what unconditional love is like. It's huge. It's amazing. So we're offering people a great deal. We just need to learn how to offer it better and faster and easier. Um, on Saturday, this person says, I attended uh, the... Uh, 80th birthday party for a relative and I made the stupid decision to save gas and money and ride with a couple of other relatives to the place of the party. I told myself that since I've been practicing real love for so long I'd be fine. But it wasn't fine <laughs> because I ended up in a situation that I couldn't escape from. This is brilliant observation on your part. You thought, well I'll save a little money. Never put yourself in a situation where you can't be loving enough or where you, where you think you can't. And if there's some doubt about whether you can at least give yourself an escape route and you put yourself in a position where you weren't sure and then you you put yourself in a car with people where you couldn't get away <laughs> so then she said she continues I uh, attending the party where my ex-husband's two brothers and people started bickering and snapping at each other and then people started using alcohol <laughs> <laughs> and then the younger brother's wife is a schizophrenic. <laughs> oh, golly. And then it says, see, then two other people showed up. It looks like they hadn't bathed or changed clothes in some time. And I started having judgments. And then my mother-in-law arrived and I started to panic. And then I tried to reach some people with for real love calls and nobody was home. And the party got underway. And I ended up running away from everybody and sitting in the bathroom. <laughs> wow. I was totally incapable of feeling loving or compassionate toward anybody. The one bright spot was my stepdaughter. Um, the fact is that I was uncomfortable around all these people, ex-husbands, new girlfriend, and all this stuff. She says, what's clear is the insidiousness of imitation love and how I will use getting and protecting behaviors when I'm afraid. What made me think I could handle this situation? So keep telling the truth like you're doing now wonderful keep getting all the love that you can and as much as possible don't put yourself in situations where you either know you can't handle it or where there's any doubt that you can't and if you can't at least give yourself an out where you can drive away or where you can tell people you know hey it's been really fun um, I gotta go and then you leave and then you go find some people where you can go and tell the truth and where you can tell people, boy, I've just got to tell you this situation where I just absolutely blew it. Then you don't feel bad. You learn from it and you move on to the next situation that you learn from. And it's all about learning and growing. So I look forward to seeing you all next Tuesday. This has been just a hoot as usual. And uh, we'll see you next week. And in the meantime, remember that it's always about real love. See you then.